should come along, but it doesn't okay. half the time, so don't worry about it. Okay. Welcome to Get It Growing with the Lafayette Master Gardeners. Today we have a couple of special guests with us. One is Dr. Ron Strahan. He's our weed and turf specialist with the LSU Ag Center, who's going to be telling us a little bit about controlling weeds in our lawns and our flower beds. We also have Ms. Janae Foley, who's one of our master gardeners that are real involved. She's real involved with our nursery beds. And I'm sure she'll have a lot of good questions about how we can keep some weeds out of our beds out at the R. Nelson Horticulture Center. So we thought we'd start out by maybe talking a little bit about what are some lawn grasses that most people in Acadiana grow? Well, Stuart, really we have uh, two, two grasses that we mainly grow in this area. And that, and that is uh, St. Augustine grass and centipede grass. And I'll start off here with St. Augustine grass. St. Augustine grass is kind of a broad leaf type grass uh, that will grow fairly well in the shade. Now it won't grow in deep shade, but it does grow uh, fairly well in the shade and it's uh, one of the, about the only choices we can make for that uh, purpose. Uh, but it has a lot of requirements, uh, a lot of cultural requirements. It does require fertilizer. Uh, we like to fertilize it at least three times during the growing season. It has some brown patch itch issues where you'll end up with, uh, with dead spots in the lawn. Uh, and it does have chinch bug issues, so it's a, lo it's a, it's a grass that is a, a fine grass for the area, but it does require a good bit of maintenance. Uh, and then we have centipede grass. Centipede grass is uh, a very common type grass in this area. It's uh, kind of a pale green color, and uh, it, it, it doesn't really require a lot of fertilizer, and it's, uh, it's more of a, a turf that will grow in, in poor soil conditions, and you don't, again, you don't have to fertilize it as much. It has a little bit more water requirements. Uh, it, uh, whenever uh, your, your centipede grass is starting to, to uh, look kind of rough on you, uh, it might just need watering. We are kind of going through a drought right now, and centipede may be starting to look a little rough. Uh, but it's, it's called the Carefree Lawn of the South, and it has uh, a lot of, uh, it just doesn't have nearly as many uh, cultural requirements that St. Augustine has. I know one thing that we see with these two lawn grasses is that often people aren't aware what type of grass they have, and because they they don't know whether they have St. Augustine or Centipede, they may use the wrong approach to it. And I think like Dr. Strahan was saying, one thing with the Centipede is that if you over fertilize it, a lot of times you help out the competition. Instead of helping your, your Centipede lawn by putting fertilizer, a lot of times you encourage weeds or you build up high levels of phosphorus in your soil and that creates problems for the Centipede. So fertilizer is not always the answer for your lawn grass if you have Centipede but it really needs water and we're um, last I checked about seven eight inches below normal rainfall and more important than any fertilizer you need to keep your centipede grass watered you also need to keep your pH on the acidic side if you lime your, your lawn a lot and you have centipede liming and having a high pH a lot of times it's going to tie up a lot of the iron in your soil and your centipede lawn is not going to do well so really urge you if you're trying to get your lawn on track one of the first things to do is take a soil sample you can bring that into our office. We can run a soil sample um, for about $7. We can give you an idea of, okay, if you want to get your lawn up to speed, what you need to do in terms of pH, in terms of fertility, to, to get it going. And then with St. Augustine, another thing we see a lot on dry years are chinch bugs during the summer. So we're going into this dry year. When you start seeing patches in your yard die when we start getting into June and July, you really need to treat for those chinch bugs because we get called in a lot of times, it's too late. Chinch bugs have wiped out the lawn and in some of those cases, you're going to have to resod or replug those areas. So be on the lookout if we have a dry year for chinch bugs. And you have to look real closely at your lawn. Sometimes you can pour some soapy water on the lawn, flush them up to the surface. They look like little tiny black stink bugs, but they're going to be probably very common this year if it stays dry like this. You know, another problem I see with St. Augustine grass, uh, Stuart, is, is just with homeowners mowing too low. And that's uh, one of the reasons we have so many weed problems with St. Augustine grass. St. Augustine grass is, bu is because uh, homeowners just mow it so low, and it really prefers to be mowed at about three inches. Uh, but uh, I know the idea here is you mow it low, you don't have to mow it as often, but what you end up doing is you're thinning that turf out because its growing point is really pretty close to the soil surface, and if you sc start scalping St. Augustine grass, you can thin it out. And where you really see problems with it is in the, is in the uh, wintertime and in the uh, early spring, all the winter weed problems. Uh, you see, it's just there's no lawn covering there to, to prevent those weeds from germinating. And many of those weeds need light to germinate. 
And when your lawn is thin, a lot of light penetrates down to the soil surface and a lot of those weed seeds germinate. So that's probably why we see a lot of weed problems in St. Augustine grass. Mainly could be attributed to this mowing it too low. So three inches is about, is about where you want to maintain that turf. I've got a question. Sure. Uh, we're probably going to be going into area, uh, a period of drought again. Mm -hmm. in, in some cases, if you've got a large lawn, it's not going to be practical to keep that, that whole thing irrigated. Mm -hmm. how, how quickly will these grasses recover when we get some rain again? That's a very good question. Centipede grass is, is probably a little more sensitive to, uh, to drought. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, you can thin it out. If we have a, a, an extended period of drought, we can thin this turf out. Uh, it is a perennial, and you, you probably won't lose the turf, but you can definitely thin it out. Uh, St. Augustine grass is a little bit more drought tolerant, but okay. again, you will lose it if, uh, if we, this drought continues. So uh, the best thing you can do is, if there's any way possible, is to water the turf and, and try to get it back and keep it as healthy as possible. Also, there are drought tolerant weeds that will start infesting uh, the, uh, the turf, and that's uh, Dallas grass here is, a, is an extremely drought tolerant weed that we see a lot in, uh, in St. Augustine grass and centipede grass, and that's that clumping type turf that, uh, will, uh, that will infest the lawn whenever we're in a drought period or where, whenever you're mowing your lawn too low. And uh, that's a, a very common weed problem uh, in our turf grasses in this area. Be, be just because mainly we go, we're going through a drought and the lawn is just not nearly as efficient at, at gaining water, at getting water, as this particular weed is. So what's the treatment for this? Uh, if this is growing in your lawn, if you have centipede grass, we do have a treatment for this. And it's, it's a herbicide called Vantage, which uh, you can apply Vantage on this particular weed. It will kill the weed and not hurt the centipede grass. And that's a great thing to have, to be able to selectively remove grasses in a, in a particular turf. Now, if this grass is growing in St. Augustine grass, it really indicates that you're probably mowing that turf too low, uh, but there is no selective removal. So we'll probably have to go in with a, uh, a spot treatment of something like a Roundup. Uh, glyphosate product to try to take that out of your turf. But there is really no selective control for this one in St. Augustine. You can control it in centipede with Vantage. Though. I know you've told me before with Dallas grass, you can take advantage of the fact that it tends to not go dormant during the winter. That's a good point. Uh, if you notice, uh, if, if there's a grass, that's, that's, that's a clumping type grass, it's still kind of green in your lawn. When your lawn is dormant to semi-dormant, it's probably going to be Dallas grass. And if it's green, it will still take the herbicide in and your St. Augustine grass lawn is not likely, as likely to be injured at that period, and you can go in and spot treat Dallas grass. The, the kill will be a lot slower just because the plant is a summer type plant, but it will take the herbicide, absorb it in, and you will kill it. And that's a good strategy in the, in the St. Augustine grass lawn because you can easily find it in your St. Augustine grass because it is the only green thing out there. Right, so maybe a warm day in January, That's early a, February, go yeah. out with a little Roundup and a spray tank. Spot and just treat. spot treat these little clumps because they're going to still be nice and green yeah. like a year like we had this year, very mild winter. Mm -hmm. I know in my lawn I have some Dallas grass. You can really spot those clumps very easily during the winter where they're kind of a little bit hidden during the summer months. And the good thing about it is that it is very sensitive to Roundup and to glyphosate products, so it would be one you could take out. And what are other names people might know the Dallas grass on? I've heard bullgrass. What have you heard? Now people call, and that's one thing with these weeds, and that's a service that we offer. When you have a weed problem, you really need to get it identified by an experienced professional. You can bring weeds into our office so that we can help you identify them, or if you work with a, with a, a landscape contractor, get somebody who knows what they're talking about to, to identify it for you because when we a lot of times talk over the phone with people it's you know it's like comparing apples and oranges and if you're trying to put out a chemical these herbicides are very specific if you're putting out the wrong herbicide you're wasting your time and you may even be damaging your lawn so you need to get it identified and then you can figure out what product you want to use that's that's true and you said something in uh, when you were talking uh, just then that kind of struck me and that's picking the wrong herbicide or, or not knowing exactly which one to choose and you, you've, you've just about got to go deeper than just the, the cover of the herbicide because this is a herbicide that's really common. You can buy it just about anywhere. Uh, and it kills, it's supposed to kill weeds. It kills uh, lawn weeds plus crabgrass, but it also makes a statement on harm lawns. So that tells you that possibly, possibly, uh, you know, you could apply this one in your St. Augustine grass or centipede because it does say on harm lawns. But if you go back and read the fine print here, it'll tell you, do not use on St. Augustine grass 
and uh, centipede grass because you can damage your lawn. And I had a, someone call me this week that had actually put this product out and, on centipede grass and the centipede was really looking terrible and may not recover from it. So you've got to be really careful uh, when you make your choices of herbicide uh, that you read those labels. Very, very important. Uh, the herbicides will work pretty well, but you've got to pick the right one because, again, St. Augustine grass and centipede ga grass are really uh, susceptible to injury from herbicides, and so you've got to be careful and make sure you've got one that's labeled for St. Aug and centipede. And I've heard you both say that the weed and feed products are not necessarily good for this part of the country. Oh, well, it's a timing issue with weed and feed products. Uh, you're, uh, they have a, most of them are, uh, the herbicide that's on the weed and feed products is atrazine, uh, and it's impregnated on fertilizer granules, usually with a high concentration of nitrogen. So when, the, when it has a high concentration of nitrogen, it's not, uh, it, the, really the timing is off for the application. Because of the weed control part, you want to make the application in January or February, but unfortunately, you're fertilizing your lawn when you make this application, and it's just not a good idea to put nitrogen out uh, in your lawn in January and February because you don't want to encourage a lot of green growth during this period, and it also increases your chances for diseases, in particular brown patch, so the timing is all off on weed and feed. Really, if you're going to put weed and feed out, now is as good a time as any. You're, the, the herbicide is not going to work as well for you as it would have worked back in January or February, but the, the, but the fertilizer part, the, the herbicide is not going to work as well for you if, it, if you would have put it out in um, January or February. But because you're fertilizing, you can't make the application uh, in January and February because you don't want to encourage a lot of disease problems uh, during that time. The other thing I see people make mistakes with weed and feed often is they put too much. I had yeah. a guy last year called our office and I called Ron about, put out 10 times the label rate. He thought that it said 50,000 square feet and the bag <laughs> did, you know, um, 5,000 square feet. So they get confused on the label or the That's square true. footage. They put out 10, 15 times the rate. And once it's down, it's down. You can't do anything about it. These weed and feeds with atrazine, if they get in your flower beds, um, they are that chemical is very toxic to plants. It, that mm -hmm. chemical might be there for the next six months, killing your flowers. They're also very toxic to tree roots. And if you read the label, it says don't put it under trees. And we have seen some trees over time become damaged, especially when they're weakened by drought. Um, you can maybe create some problems with weed and feed. So it's not necessarily a bad product. We're not here to, to preach against it, but you just need to, to understand the label, read the label, and use it properly. I also want to mention, we talked a little bit about drought just because we've been so dry here, but um, I find if you mow your grass very short in a drought, that tends to really thin it a lot. And We always encourage people maybe back off on, on your mowing a little bit or mow a little higher just to kind of help that grass maybe um, be able to tolerate the drought a little bit. And then be on the lookout for grubs. When we have dry weather, our grub population in the soil, these little white worm-looking um, creatures that are actually the larva, the June bug, May beetle that we're seeing so many of right now are eating the roots of your of your lawn, and their damage becomes much more significant. And their numbers become much higher during a drought. So if you notice some dead spots in your yard, maybe dig in the soil, look for those white grubs, and if you see a lot of them, you really need to treat, especially in a dry year like we're going to have, because I've seen them do some damage to lawns during during droughts. And how do we treat? There are a number of different products. Um, they've come out with a lot of good granular insecticides. Um, Seven is a good product against grub. Bayer um, Chemical Company makes a, a product that has imidacloprid in it that's very good against grub. So any lawn garden center um, chain store should have a good grub control product. And you want to make sure once you put it out to really water it in so it gets to where those grubs are. Um, you also want to be careful with fertilizer. When we get in a drought like we are right now, if you put out fertilizer, fertilizer is a salt, and you don't water it in, that fertilizer sits there, and it's also that runs the potential of burning your grass. So don't put out fertilizer on dry soil unless you're able to water. That, that's a, it's a very good point. And when we are in a drought, you just got to really take special care of your lawn, and, and watering is going to be key. But you pointed out something uh, about mowing height. And, and mowing height is really important, but it's even more important when we are in a drought. And you just don't want to mow lawns short anyway, uh, especially St. Augustine grass and centipede grass. But the, bolt, the, the, leaf, the amount of leaf that you see there, that's a reflection of the roots. Uh, and so if you do mow or scalp your lawn, your roots are not going to be nearly as efficient in pulling in water. And if you're ever going to be efficient in pulling in water, now would be the time. Uh, but just because we are in this drought and, and it just the plants are just not efficient whenever you uh, remove all the uh, green growth, uh, the leaf area. And, you know, people will call and ask, well, how much should I water my lawn if you're able to water your lawn? And 
we look to try to get about an inch of rain a week. And you might want to, you know, if you can, set up a sprinkler system, put out some little rain gauges, and, and kind of collect and see how much water you're actually putting out. Sometimes what works better, too, is instead of putting out one inch all at once, because often when you do that, you get a lot of runoff, you might want to water maybe in 15-minute cycles, and then a couple hours later, turn on the sprinkler again. And that helps that water to seep in rather than to just run off. Because at some point, if when you put out a large amount of water all at once, you're going to get runoff, but you'll have less of that if you have some short cycles. And as always, never water at night. You don't want to keep your lawn grass wet overnight. Um, that encourages diseases to form. Um, and we get a lot of trouble when we water a lot, especially there's a little gray leaf spot that gets in St. Augustine if you keep it too wet. You want to water in the early morning where that grass can dry quite quickly, and that'll prevent a lot of disease problems. What are some of the weeds we see in our flower beds out at our Nelson, Janae? Well, we are seeing this year, and it's evidently a result of the drought. I'll seek your opinion on that. Okay. A, a lot of the vetch. Mm -hmm. And this is a particular problem that people with dogs are complaining about. It seems to get caught in the, in the dog's coat when, yeah. when, when well, they're out running in the fields. Talk about this one, this one first. This is, a, this is creeping bed straw, and it's just a common winter annual. And if you'll just throw it on here, it kind of, whoops, yeah. it kind of sticks to you whenever like you... Like a Velcro. It's like a Velcro type. It just kind of sticks, and, and really that's a way of transport for these seed. Uh, but this is creeping bed straw. It's a, it's a common winter annual, uh, very common in flower beds. But there are products that you can apply pre-emerge, uh, say if you'd made that application back in October, that would have been uh, very, very effective in controlling creeping bed straw. Again, just a common, uh, common winter annual that's, that you'll find in flower beds. Heavy, heavy seed producer, but the reason that it sticks to you is that's just a means of transport for these uh, seed, uh, so they can go to another flower bed or go to somebody else's yard. But it, uh, but this one is kind of aggravating because it does stick to you and gets all over your dogs and pets. Now, I just hand pull it. Uh, it it's uh, producing seed, and you want to get them out before it drops all those seed, and it's it, it's dropping a bunch of seed in this uh, studio right now. It's just a really common plant. And this is something too I want to want to mention too because we take care of this at the demonstration gardens, you don't want to put something like this in, in your compost pile because you're asking for trouble. This is a this is a plant that goes in the garbage to be hauled away. That's right, and it is a an annual, and when you have an annual, the ultimate goal of an annual plant is to produce seed, and this one is, is fulfilling the goal right now because it's producing lots of seed, and that's next year's crop, and it's adding that to the soil seed bank. So again, you want to get it out of there. Really, you want to get it out before it gets to this point. Hand pull it out of there, and you won't be dealing with it. And this is another really, really common plant, and this is a, this is a vetch, it's just like common vetch. It's in the legume family, so it makes these little peas. It also has some kind of some pretty flowers, little purple flowers. Uh, the problem with this plant is there really is no good control for it other than hand pulling, but you want to hand pull it again before it produces the seed, uh, before it drops these seeds. So if it's in your landscape or in your lawns, for that matter, get it out now because you don't want to drop all those seed in there. Uh, and again, you're going to be dealing with this plant again next year. No pre-emerge control really for this one right here, though. It's uh, very common, though, in, in flowers. Now, everyone's familiar with clover. Yeah, and this clover right here is going through a lot of drought stress. Uh, but this is white clover, and it's already produced its white flower. Uh, this is an, what we call an indicator plant. It indicates uh, low fertility, low nitrogen fertility in a yard. And you really see it in St. Augustine grass where you don't mow very often. You see it a lot in centipede grass because you don't fertilize that particular turf very often uh, because the, the turf do doesn't require it. If you got it growing in St. Augustine grass or Bermuda grass, it indicates that you're not fertilizing your turf enough, uh, but we do have herbicides that will take it out. It's very sensitive to atrazine. Uh, but right now, if it is growing in your yard uh, and we start getting some rain, start fertilizing your yard. Really, in, for most of, many of these winter weeds, if you Treat your lawn correctly uh, during the growing season. You'll find that you don't see a lot of these winter problems because your lawn is so thick and healthy and can uh, outcompete most of these weeds or won't allow them to, to, uh, to germinate. How about this one? I know this is one that we get a lot of calls on. Uh, yeah, this one has a lot of names. Uh, we, but this is purple nut sedge, and some people call it nut grass or, or cocoa grass. Uh, but this one is uh, it's not really a grass at all. It's actually a sedge. And uh, herbicides that kill grasses won't kill this particular plant. It's kind of a tough plant to kill. It's, it's ranked number one in the world of all crops uh, as the worst weed in the world. As far as, as killing this particular plant, uh, there's a herbicide out called Ma Manage, and they've changed the name this year to Sedgehammer. Uh, and Sedgehammer can be used in a flower bed. 
Uh, around all woody ornamentals, you can't apply it over the top of anything, uh, but it can be applied uh, uh, around all woody ornamentals and that will remove this. Image is another herbicide that also has activity on purple nut sedge. But it's a really tough plant to, to uh, control because it produces so many nut bits in the soil. And once you get it, it's, it's very difficult uh, to, uh, to get out of your landscape. We, uh, we rank this one as the number one weed problem in flower beds, and if you have it, uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. This is Florida betony. Another name for it is rattlesnake weed, and it produces these little tubers in the soil. I don't know how well you can see that. It produces these white tubers, little, and it looks like uh, the end of a rattlesnake's tail, and so it's also called rattlesnake weed. There's really no control for this plant in a flower bed situation. We see it a lot. Uh, with daylily producers, they have a lot of problems with Florida betony. It makes a purple flower, but it makes these little white tubers uh, that are look, they look like the ends of a rattlesnake. Uh, and so there's, it's just a common plant, uh, and it's becoming even more problem, uh, problematic in uh, flower beds in the Lafayette area. And uh, we're looking, we're having some research right now. We're conducting some research uh, trying to remove this one, but right now we've been pretty unsuccessful. And the little wild strawberry seems to be having a yeah. wonderful year this yeah, year. Yeah, this is a good year for, for wild strawberry. This is Indian mock strawberry. Uh, again, something that we find a lot in thin lawns. It does make a little strawberry plant. It's susceptible to several herbicides. Weed Be Gone is a product that works pretty well on it. Uh, there's a product called uh, Fertilone Weed Free Zone that works really well on it. But it really indicates a thin lawn. If you if you're mow your lawn properly, especially St. Augustine grass, raise that mowing height, and fertilize, uh, you'll see less problems with weeds like this because this is a creeping type plant that has to have space to creep in. And if your lawn is growing uh, healthily and, 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 and is, is mowed properly, you just don't have problems with, uh, with Indian mock strawberry. And we got Virginia buttonweed. And this uh, is probably going to be a good year for Virginia buttonweed if our drought continues uh, the way it's doing right now. Uh, lawns are going to be thinner and Virginia buttonweed is just looking for space. This is the number one weed problem in lawns in the south and uh, it's a, a perennial plant that reproduces by seed. It makes seed above ground, it makes seed below ground and uh, it also stem fragments. It reproduces by stem fragments. So when you mow your lawn you stand a good chance of, uh, of getting problems with Virginia buttonweed. Just a, a, a really tough plant to deal with because we don't have herbicides that work that well on this plant. Uh, one herbicide that uh, a, a homeowner can, can use uh, is called Fertilone Weed Free Zone. It's, it's common uh, at uh, garden centers everywhere. About three tablespoons in a gallon of water, but it's going to take repeat applications and it can injure your lawn uh, as our temperatures increase. So that's one of the things we can do. But this is Virginia buttonweed, one of the worst things you can have in your lawn. Maybe talk a little bit about how if people would want to maybe selectively in their flower beds try yeah. to remove some problem okay. weeds. <clears throat> well, um, many times what we're faced with is we have a lot of weed problems in our landscape areas and probably most people are familiar with Roundup and glyphosate products and you normally spray those products. But uh, because it, some of these weeds are growing in sensitive areas, you just have to uh, find a creative way to apply Roundup. So one way is the rubber glove, cotton glove method of Roundup application. And you simply just take a rubber glove and you uh, slip it on. And you have a cotton glove. You put the cotton glove on over it. You put four ounces, four ounces of a glyphosate product like Eraser. One, another product is called High Yield Kills All or a, a good Roundup product with at least 41% uh, glyphosate. And you put 32 ounces of water and four ounces of that glyphosate product and you dip your hand in there and you squeeze your hand so you're not dripping the product anywhere and you go to and you just you find your weeds and you wipe them. Bermuda grass for instance is really common in, in flower bed areas and you just simply wipe the weed and you don't rip the weeds apart. I know you hate them and you want to rip them out of your landscape but you just gently wipe the weeds and you'll find this is a very very effective method for taking uh, unwanted plants out of your flower bed and you can use Roundup, which is usually pretty good on most flowers, uh, or on most weeds, but you can't spread in, in most situations because of all the drift issues and uh, killing uh, maybe an azalea plant that you, that you want to save. So something like Virginia buttonweed, really getting to be more common in flower beds, just wipe those plants and just go on to the next plant because it, uh, you just gently wipe it. You don't tear it apart. You don't want to tear any of the foliage off. You just want to gently wipe it, and it helps get that product uh, into, the, uh, into the weed and is, is very, very successful. How about removing like poison ivy or like little trees in, from your flower beds? 
Uh, again, I get a lot of calls on uh, taking out unwanted vines in a landscape situation. Uh, this is a product that you can find at most garden centers called uh, Green Light Cut Vine and Stump Killer. And it's actually just triclopyr. And triclopyr is very effective on woody vines and, and woody plants in general. But you would uh, put some rubber gloves on if you're sensitive especially to uh, poison ivy. Uh, find the origin of that vine in the soil and uh, snip it and treat that stump with this product. Just flip the top and, and treat the stump with the product. And it will kill that stump. There won't be any suckering occurring. And the vine that's growing in your landscape will die also because you removed it from, the, uh, from its root source. So uh, also vines growing up in trees, very important. Pull that vine back, cut that vine, treat that stump. The big vine growing up in your tree will die. It's just not practical to treat a big tree. Up. Uh, you may kill the tree if you spray herbicides up in there. Won't harm the tree at all, and this is extremely effective. Uh, it's a product that really works well on woody species. Do you have any products that are more organic for those people that have children and might have concerns about chemicals? Sure. There, there is a product that we've tested at LSU, and it's, uh, it's actually vinegar and clove oil, and it's got a nice smell to it also. But it works really well on annuals. Uh, like, for instance, this is crabgrass. And this crabgrass plant, it, it's a small annual, and it's actively growing. It would be really effective on this particular plant. You just spray it, and it kills it out in about uh, two days. Uh, it works by contact, so coverage is, is an issue with this, with this product. So, but it is a, an organic product with vinegar and clove oil, and again, it has that nice smell. And, and I you like still the read the label instructions. But very, very important, again, read the label. You, you, with all these products, you need to read the label. Extremely important just to, to use these products in a way that will make them work best for you. We had mentioned maybe there were some new Roundup type products. It looked, it looked like they just cut us. What happened is that our timer, that their timer broke. Mm -hmm.